All right, we'll get started here. So it's one o'clock. I need everyone in the room to really quickly think about the last time you went through a new hire onboarding experience, whether that's something you're doing currently, whether that's something that's been a decade or two of in the past, or even if that's something that you don't wanna think about because it's so long ago and you wanna think about the last time you mentored somebody through that process. So just think about what that process looked like. Think about how complex it was. And then think about what that looks like in the shoes of Alan, who's going to be our fictitious Contoso employee today. So Alan just started a new job with our IT team. We want Alan to be confident in this new role as fast as possible. We want him to be helping the team. We want him familiar with our tool set. We want him to be able to contribute in the team today. So we're gonna talk through how we get Alan up to speed so fast with as little as just his credentials. Once he's been onboarded, once he's received his credentials, we're gonna show how Alan can start to contribute and gain confidence with our tool set today. Few things we're gonna go through is talk through some new tool sets. So all of this will be new it, to Alan, at least. Some of you may have familiarity with Jupyter, or you may have familiarity with Polyglot Notebooks. So we'll talk through those because they're new to Alan. We'll talk through how to get started using them, and then we'll go through a bunch of demos. So we're gonna have a lot of fun towards the tail end of this. So what is Jupyter? Jupyter's a Big framework, it's got three major components. So you've got a file format, your notebook format, which is how you write and author content. So that's gonna be markdown and code cells. Those code cells can be different languages, everything from PowerShell to Python to R to OCaml. There's kernels for just about every use case. And when you author that notebook, when you connect to those kernels that are, they can be running on a local server, they can be running on a remote server. You're actually just sending messages between those code cells and the kernel running on a different server. So it's really extensible in that fashion where if there's anything you wanna do, it's just a message. You're just sending a message to a remote server, it's processing it and returning the text output back. By default, the Jupyter team themselves did not build a PowerShell kernel, but Microsoft did. So the .NET Interactive team produced multiple kernels for Jupyter. Everything from PowerShell to C Sharp to F Sharp, even including different packages through NuGet, like Kusto and SQL. There's also more than just that. So there's HTML, JavaScript, Mermaid, which we'll touch on in a second, which is a graphical ability to produce from text a uh, scalable vector graphic, an SVG file. So you can do dynamic documentation with even graphics. And the .NET Interactive team used to have two functions. So they used to have their notebook formats and the extensions and the kernels all named .NET Interactive. They have rebranded the client side portion, so the notebook functions and the extensions to Polyglot Notebooks. And so that's just available in Visual Studio Code right now. You could go grab it and it takes a couple seconds. All of a sudden you've got Jupyter functionality available in VS Code supporting PowerShell and c -sharp and those other programming languages. The beauty is that this gets you started very fast. So we'll talk through some more advanced ways to benefit from kernels because at the end of the day, it's just a messaging bus. So we can run that server, like I said, anywhere. And so the beauty of that is we can run that server hosted, we can do dynamic servers, we can do single instance servers, ephemeral servers, whatever we want with those different kernels and be able to 
give the same client experience, whether you want to author in a browser or you want to author through VS Code. So getting started, three things that you need as prerequisites. You need VS Code or some other authoring software. So Winget install VS Code. You need the .NET SDK so you can do PowerShell Core. All your Jupyter notebooks are affected all your Jupyter kernels are effectively running on a Linux operating system. So keep in mind that .NET Core is gonna be your foundation there. And then PowerShell Core. Once you have that, you can just install the notebook extension and you're up and running. So really quickly, we'll just start this in the background. if paste works. Oh, joy. <laughs> exactly. So what we will do is just restart that desktop. <laughs> We're logging in as Alan. It's his first day. It's on his desktop. And clipboard still isn't working. So <laughs> We'll just run these quick. So Winget Visual Studio Code, that'll process in single user mode, but you can run it in full user uh, system install as well. And a good call out here too is you don't need to author in Visual Studio Code. So if you do have a different preference, the notebook format is very extensible in that it's just a JSON file in the background. So all you're doing is setting up different code blocks and applying what you want within the code blocks or the markdown blocks. Then we'll toss the .NET SDK up. And another good note is the .NET Interactive team has also opened so or provided the, the full, uh, their compiling software for notebooks. So they actually have the processor so you can author notebooks dynamically yourself. So you can push into their executables to generate your own notebooks dynamically based on whatever content you have. And then there's also um, the .NET REPL project that uh, they have available as well. And that REPL is read, evaluate, print loop, which is a programming paradigm that really started with Perl and some of the more interactive languages, but Jupyter really reinforces where you really want to be able to write a line of code, produce an output, evaluate what that looks like, and then repeat that process in the next code cell. And so we'll see what that looks like here in a second. And last but not least, our favorite PowerShell core. And what we'll also go through is a demo afterwards of showing this in a Docker container. So even on Alan's first day, he wouldn't even have to do this. So we wouldn't need Alan to install Visual Studio Code, .NET Interactive, PowerShell, any of that, because we can also package that, prepackage that into those ephemeral user instances I was mentioning. Okay. And let's just down. And 
Go. Okay. So one thing we can look at here is when we go to a new file, we now have the option for a Jupyter Notebook. I think that's because I didn't fully uninstall the extension, so we'll just make sure that the right extension's installed. So that's our last step before we can author and then work with these notebooks. Beautiful. So when we go to author, we have the option for polyglot notebooks, regular Jupyter notebooks, and this is what our format looks like. So you can see first and foremost, it's detecting kernels in the top right. So we'll select the default notebook format with .NET Interactive, there is a .DIB format that the .NET Interactive team manages, but you can fully use the native Jupyter Notebook format as well. These are the languages available. I mentioned a few of them earlier. We'll use PowerShell today, but definitely there's more options. So what we end up with is essentially this notebook. We've got code, markdown cells. We have the ability to run these cells. And just as an example, PS version. Yeah tab complete is not happy because I don't have that extension installed. You can see we get output. And so this code cell is running in context of the entire document. And then the output is also able to be passed into other code cells through variable sharing. So this is a fully dedicated session. And so if we go say, set that to X, Then in our next cell, we just say X get member. <laughs> Nothing happens because I didn't test that. So we're good though. So what we'll do is we'll open the actual demo file now so that it's not as uh, unrehearsed for y'all. Okay. All right, so back to Alan's first day. Um, if you did want him to interface with Visual Studio Code, you wanted him to use the fully native local client experience, that's all that it would have taken. So now, as we get started, this is a pre-authored notebook. So this is something a team lead or an author in your team, someone who's more senior may create, or it may be something you collaborate and iterate on regularly together. So you can see, all of these are just markdown cells. So any of this is standard markdown. You can bring it in, you can edit it in an external editor if you want. But once they're rendered, it fully shows just as markdown. And then you can interface with it just like you would with markdown as well. So hyperlinks within documents, across documents, etc. So now I was mentioning mermaid. This is an example of mermaid. This isn't a talk about Mermaid, but there's a few good ones out there. So this is just a layout of different visualizations and how they relate. And this will actually build us a flowchart. So when we look at this flowchart, this is what we're gonna cover today. So we're gonna go through some basics, four steps in the basics, then we're gonna hop down, go through some complex steps that tie those basics together, and that'll be three steps. So starting with the basics, we wanna make sure we've got the right modules. So we're gonna be working with the Graph API today for Alan's first functional contribution to the team. So these are the modules we know we'll be using. We'll just toss those in a variable. 
you, because it's Markdown, you can put really nicely formatted context. You can even link out to, like I mentioned, external documentation. Like if you want to give them a uh, link through directly to the PS document, the PowerShell documentation about something. So if it's new to them or you just want to provide more context, there's plenty of opportunities to do nice things like that. So get our modules. Make sure they aren't already installed. Make sure that we trust the PS gallery. And that finished running. There's a little timer in every code cell, so you automatically start to track when something's running, when something's finished, and you can move on to the next. And like I said, all these are in line, so the variables get shared across. And I'm actually surprised that went so fast, so I'm gonna make sure I've got those modules installed. Yeah. It'll be, yeah, some three, three, or four. That, that's possible, yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, because the extension is actually installing the kernel. So that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good call out. Thanks, Alexi. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you, Stephen. So a great call out is that the P, the polyglot extension actually installs the PowerShell core uh, kernel itself. So like Alexi pointed out, there's actually two different versions. So when I installed through Winget, that's a different instance of PowerShell than the kernel that any of the notebooks will actually be passing any of the messages to. So something to keep in mind is that the kernel and your local version of PowerShell can be different instances entirely. All right. And we do have those modules, so should be good to go. So what we'll do now that we're in the manage permission section, if you've worked with the graph modules before, it can be a little bit challenging to know exactly what permissions you need. Oh, another question. Sorry, just quickly. Yeah. Was there mention that there are timers throughout here? How difficult would it be to maybe dump this as like log data so you could users with expectations that you think about during the process? Yeah, that's actually a great call out. So how, question. yep, can you, uh, so, Going through this, dumping this as log data to give people a baseline of how long these commands can take, uh, that's a great example of these notebooks do retain their state. So everything that you put into a code cell and run, in that instance of that notebook file, the output as well as the duration is going to stay in that file. So great point. And an extension of that is you can actually automate the notebooks themselves as well. So there is tooling where you can have an authored notebook file, pass it in, it'll run that instance of the notebook file and retain all of that state about the execution. As I was mentioning though, so when you're working with the graph, it can be difficult to find your permissions. And so this is just a really quick, easy way to find any permissions you need when working with the graph API. If you just pass it a command, it'll actually give you all the permissions you need to interface with that specific endpoint. And so now we'll just pass that in. We'll do an interactive authentication here. And 
who are logged in. Something that's good to note, and this is an extension of what Alexi brought up earlier as well, is um, your context for this does want to stay within the process. So when you are keeping these modules, this gets more important depending on where you have the runtime at, but keeping that context scope is valuable. So I know I have my mouse on top of it, but keeping the context scope just to the process is helpful. So now what we'll do, Alan has already received some email on his first day. We can see it's just our normal Azure AD Identity Protection Digests. So everyone loves these. If we go in, we'll make sure that we log, we get the right context for Alan. And then we want to get the first message from Alan's mailbox. We can see just a quick summary. We've got that email came through. And now we may be monitoring that mailbox and we may want to send a summary of that email message to a Teams channel. So what we can do, we've just got a specific Teams channel over here. We toss together an HTML body for what we want to put into that Teams message. We prep that. And now we just send our Teams message. Hop over into Teams, and you can see we've got a new message from Alan here, and it's got a summary of that email. So in a situation where you may have legacy reports going to an email, you want to get them into a Teams channel so you can have more extensibility in interfacing with them, or you want a running log for the team to monitor rather than having shared mailboxes, because we all hate those. So Good way to just forward those messages if you want to turn off like the email address for a dedicated team or a channel, those types of situations where you could still get content from a mailbox or multiple mailboxes to a single shared channel. All right, so combining these, add in a little bit more situational context. So, Another nice function of the graph is you can pull user date, uh, user functional reports. So what people are doing in O365. So a good example of this is email activity. Maybe you want to see how many messages are being sent. Maybe you want to get a good summary on what that looks like over time. So you can start to see, hey, do we have users actually using their mailboxes? Do we have users that just aren't even functioning in O365 anymore? So we'll download this, save it as a temporary CSV so we can process it. And then similar to what we were doing, we'll just summarize that, get some measure object output, put that together in a nice table down here. And this one I'll spend a second just describing. So up here, what we're doing is we're just setting up that table, converting it to a table fragment, HTML fragment, and storing that explicitly as a string. And like I had mentioned, all we're doing is passing messages between different kernels. So this is an example with .NET Interactive. We can use a magic command, basically a hash bang. So hash bang set, and we define a new variable that we're passing in, what its MIME type is, and what the variable source is. It's a PowerShell kernel, variable, name table. We bring that in as a C-sharp variable, as table, and then we can actually display it as a different MIME type. Now, this is a good example of what you can do interfacing with multiple kernels. I will say this is an acknowledged bug that they want to be able to get the MIME type outputs directly from the PowerShell kernel. So this is a good example for now, but hopefully you don't even need to bother with it in the future. All right. And now we basically take that table, send it into a new chat message. If we hop back over to Teams, you can see that table now appeared as a message in Teams. So another good example of just being able to pull data from different API endpoints, summarize it. This could be an Azure function. This could be different use cases. 
but a good example of there's some things we may not want to fully automate. There's always that point of balance between, hey, could we easily automate these reports? Yes. But then we also no longer have that opportunity for Alan or the next employee to have some experience with things they may not be familiar with. So a good way to ensure that is having simple, consistent procedures that you can share and make sure people get exposure through. We'll clean up our temp file. And so that's just an example of one notebook. So pretty simple use case, puts together a few different concepts. Alan may have had tons of experience with PowerShell. Maybe he works with the graph modules every day in his previous job, but he may not have. He may not have been familiar with any of this, and he may not have had the context of how any of these commands even functioned. So by putting these together in line with our context and our documentation, now you're able to start to move forward and even gain more skills. So. We already showed the diagram. Um, as I mentioned, that's Mermaid. So Mermaid is a JavaScript functionality that uh, will auto-generate those visuals. It can do everything from pie charts, buyer charts, flow charts, user flow diagrams, all sorts of fun stuff. So now let's get into some more advanced use cases. So if we think about Allen, new job, new processes, if you came into a job, you were handed that notebook on your first day, do you feel like that would be a good way to get started? Yeah? Okay. So the other aspect of this is if you're that person who's responsible for training Alan, you've now got a reference point to baseline Alan's skills. You, if he got stuck anywhere in that notebook, you know where, you know why. You know if it was an intentional error, if it was the API that had an error, you get more context than just, oh, hey, go do this thing. And there's another aspect to this too of what's Contoso's experience. So we want this to be something that multiple users can use. We want the ability for normal enterprise functionality like single sign-on. We want centralized management and we want it to be cost efficient. So there's more that we want from a solution like this as soon as it becomes valuable. And that's where something like Jupyter Hub comes into the picture. So what we were looking at is polyglot notebooks. Polyglot notebooks are an implementation of Jupyter. What we'll be looking at with Jupyter Hub is actually a different implementation from polyglot notebooks. And Jupyter Hub gives us the ability to work with Jupyter Labs. And hop back over here. This is where we go back to, if all Alan has on his first day is his credentials, we can get Alan to log into my apps. He can launch our Jupyter Hub application. We'll have, if I can click a button, Alan sign in. And now what we're doing is we're actually spawning a new container instance of .NET Interactive in Fargate. So if we look over here, our Jupyter Hub task is actually running from a service, but that's long lived, long running. What it just did is it spawned a new Jupyter Lab instance as a brand new task. So if you're not familiar with containers and everything, it, it Seems like a lot, but it's pretty simple. And then the other piece I'll note is in the documentation for the talk, there's actually a former output of all the different components that went into this. So former is a way to export AWS configuration as cloud formation. So it's just a good reference point. It won't work out of the box, but it'll give you a good idea of everything it took to build it to this point. So if we go back to Jupyter Hub, our individual instance should be started here in a second. And 
So this is the web interface. If all you wanted to do was get started fast, all Alan had to do was log into a web portal. Now he's got an interactive browser and he can start to interface with different functionality. We have PowerShell in a browser that's actually running on a container somewhere else, but we were able to do that in about a minute and a half for Alan. So one thing I'm gonna do super quick because one of the demos does take a little while to prep, is I'm just gonna come over here and install a couple functions. All right, so this is just prepping one of the demos. Um, this is installing something with PIP, which is the Power BI client. It's registering that module in with Jupyter Labs. So this just takes a minute to run because this container instance only has like a gig of memory. So what we'll do though, while that's running, we'll hop back over here, hop into PowerShell. Download these files quick. I promise this is easier when you're looking the right direction. <laughs> awesome. And so this is the document we just ran in VS Code, but now it's just in a browser. So if you didn't want to have to worry about making sure that operating environment was running and pre-built, you can just give Alan access to his own Jupyter Lab instance and start functioning that quick. So the other things I wanted to touch on here, um, since these are able to um, interface, you could have Jupyter Labs be integrated with Git. So you could just on boot have Git pull down any notebooks that you want. So if you had a repository of some baseline notebooks, you just have those auto populate from the most recent Git revisions, create local copies, and you can immediately start going rather than the little workaround I did of setting a couple invoke web request commands to download some files. So the other nice part you can do is you may want Alan to still work from uh, VS Code, but you may not want to have to deal with uh, installing and managing the kernels. So one of the options you can do as well is you can actually select kernels from remote existing servers. And so just a quick example of that, we can come there, 
go back to our Jupyter Hub instance and create an authorization token. Toss that in there. All right, well, that doesn't want to connect. So we're going to just call it a day there. But <laughs> uh, uh, when this functions, uh, this bearer token can just be generated. You can connect the kernel, so the local notebook instance would actually just be sending those message commands to the remote server and running them on that Docker instance in the background. So you can still use the Jupyter Labs model if you wanted to do all of your builds to a container image, publish those container images, and have all of the code actually running in a secure environment so that you don't have to be running code on local machines or you don't want to keep files on local machines. You could technically have remote VS code sessions into Jupyter Labs instances. So it's sort of like a light version of um, Cloud Workspaces or GitHub workspaces. All right. Okay, that one failed to build, so we will try that again quick. And while that's running, one other example of this, um, I did mention there's that former export. So this is the cloud formation template for all that infrastructure in the background. Um, quick example of another use case. So if you have started playing with like PowerShell AI module, um, there's different chat GPT interfaces. So this is a good example. Kevin earlier in the week put the FizzBuzz challenge in Slack. So if we wanted to interface with ChatGPT and see how efficient ChatGPT could be in processing this, we can, and I have to work, do a little workarounds because I'm using GPT-3 rather than using the uh, GPT-4 model. So that's why this looks a little bit more confusing than it should be. Um, get that secret from our vault. And then we're just saying, hey, AI, give me FizzBuzz in the fewest number of characters possible. And then we're gonna strip out the PowerShell and we're just gonna have that right available and we're gonna run it. So we've got FizzBuzz in about 10 seconds. <laughs> um, if you were in the other talks about AI like Pierre's, um, be careful with this. Obviously don't just blindly run code that something randomly generated and you haven't vetted yourself, but it is possible, it is functional. So there's a lot of potential. Uh, this is just another good example of uh, being able to take content, dynamically create new workbooks and new content in workbooks. Question? <laughs> the care? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so 66. So not the most efficient by any means, but a good starting point. So if you were at his code golf session, you could probably already see a couple ways to improve that a little bit. And last one. All right, that did build successfully. So uh, this one, this example, doesn't really have anything to do with PowerShell to say, but it's another good example of how you can start working with Jupyter Notebooks. 
So a lot of hist historical use cases for Jupyter Notebooks came from machine learning use cases and data analytics use cases. And so this is a good example of integrating with um, the Power BI dynamic visualizations and being able to take some data and quickly produce visuals using that data in Power BI. Oh, yes, I can. Maybe. <laughs> and I'll talk through it in a second. I just need to actually download the, uh, the file we wanted to use. Or actually, I'll just upload it quick. Or we deleted it, so I do have to run it again. Okay. And how are we doing on time? Five minutes, perfect. So since this was a brand new PowerShell session, those modules did get installed. That's what you saw flashing up there. We get our permissions. We do another interactive device login because we are on a remote host this time. Download our report now. Hop back over to this. So quick explanation. We're just, if you aren't familiar with Python, we're just importing a couple modules and uh, one of those being pandas. We authenticated against the graph. And so now we're able to interface with Power BI. And so what we're gonna do is import that CSV of our email data into a pandas data frame. So basically a table. Um, then we are going to call Power BI Visualize, but I need to do a hard refresh of the browser quick. So one more second. Um, that issue is uh, that Power BI data visualization is actually using JavaScript and the client side hasn't refreshed since we installed the module. So make sure we've got our data still. And now we've got a Power BI visualization loading up off of that email report that we just downloaded. So in a couple seconds, maybe we have a Power BI report. <laughs> so um, just <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Some of these demos work, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just good examples of how you can start to string these concepts together, start to interface with different languages or different teams who may prioritize different languages and start to just bring better collaboration and better accessibility to a lot of your content. So uh, I will finish up a couple slides here just because there's a couple more talking points. Um, Good example, running that remote Docker container, that instance can be in a secure enclave. So you can use it for privileged access, remote access type scenarios, um, 70 plus languages. I mentioned there's a ton of kernels, so plenty of options, Python being one of those. Documentation is time consuming, so maybe just pass your code to GPT to get documentation as a starting point and just ask it to format it in Markdown for you. And then now all of a sudden you got your markdown for all of your notebooks. And that's me. So a few other notes in the PowerPoint that's uploaded with all the content. There's a bunch of reference links. Uh, Doug Fink, PowerShell AI modules. Um, there, there's a lot of content that goes into all these pieces. So um, this, all these links will be accessible through the GitHub repo. So that'll be there. Um, then there's also, this is an example of the integration. So if you're curious on how all that stuff worked together in the background, that's a high level flow of what that looks like. This one was not generated with Mermaid. This one was hand-drawn. So 50-50 on Mermaid. Um, but yep, that's what I do. That's who I am. So 
Let me know if you all want to talk. Happy to talk about Jupiter or anything else.